Thank you for listening to the Health and Safety Podcast. I am Michael Wong, founder and executive director of the Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety. The Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety believes that all patients receiving opioids should be continuously electronically monitored in healthcare facilities. We are often asked by our clinical followers what patient monitoring systems that we would recommend. To help with the decision-making process, today we will be discussing some factors and studies that may help with that selection process. In addition, as advocates of continuous patient monitoring, if I can be frank, I believe that we have failed to speak at length about the benefits of patient monitoring. Preventing adverse events and patient deaths has been our focus. We have not made as good a financial argument for continuous patient monitoring as we might have. A human life can never be measured in dollars and cents. That said, I understand that executives are responsible for keeping their healthcare facilities profitable. Clinicians trying to convince executives of the need for capital expenditures often have to demonstrate the financial implications of such an investment. Do the dollars and cents spent provide a return on investment? Do the dollars and cents spent help improve work efficiency or optimize bed usage? To help answer these questions and provide some guidance on selecting patient monitoring devices, I have with me a great panel of experts. Melissa Powell is Chief Operating Officer of the Allure Group. Priyanka Shaw is Project Engineer at ECRI Institute. And Charlie Whelan is Director of Consulting Transformational Health at Frost & Sullivan. Welcome to the podcast. Let's start with some brief introductions for listeners. Melissa, let's start with you. Could you please give us a brief introduction? Sure. Hi, Michael. My name is Melissa Powell, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Allure Group. We have a chain of subacute and long-term care facilities in New York City. We have 1,500 beds throughout Brooklyn and Manhattan, and we work closely with our hospital partners to bring patients to our location for subacute rehab to then go home, as well as to come for long-term care services. Great. Thank you, Melissa. That was a good introduction. And Priyanka? Sure, Michael. So I'm a project engineer in the health devices group at ECRI Institute. ECRI Institute is a 50-year-old, not-for-profit healthcare and research organization that's based out of Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania. My background is in biomedical engineering, and here at ECRI, I have been researching and writing comparative evaluations of medical equipment, mostly patient monitoring, for the last three years. So far, I have covered wearable, contact-free, and continuous vital sign monitoring systems for lower acute care areas, as well as ICU physiologic monitoring systems with a focus on alarm management. Thank you so much, Priyanka. And last, but certainly not least, Charlie? Thank you, Michael, for the invitation to join the podcast today. My name is Jeff Whalen. I'm the Director of Consulting for Frost & Sullivan's Transformational Healthcare Practice. Frost & Sullivan is a 55-plus-year-old global market research and consulting company, uh, and I have done a, a number of projects in the patient monitoring space looking at their impact on the continuum of care and related healthcare economics. Excellent. Thank you so much, Charlie. There are a number of continuous patient monitoring solutions available, bedside systems, wearable, as well as non-contact systems. Priyanka, perhaps you could give us an overview? Absolutely. So these systems uh, are used in lower acute care areas, such as a medical treatment floor, with an intent to continuously monitor vital signs that help in detection and notification of changes in patient's status to the clinicians. These changes could be impending sepsis, general deterioration, or respiratory depression. Because we know that these conditions develop over the course of hours, the theory is that continuous monitoring can help identify problems that arise between spot check intervals. In practice, spot check monitoring is usually the standard of care in this um, setting. Diving into the various modalities, wearable systems usually include a small and lightweight display unit which is attached to the patient and allows the patient to move more freely. Then there are non-contact or contact free systems that monitor certain vital signs without any physical connection to the patient. These systems typically use a sensor placed on a bed or a chair, which means that they can only monitor stationary patients. 
There is one more solution that involves using a spot check monitor, which can be part of the bedside and used in a continuous mode. So any of these modalities could be used to do continuous monitoring. Excellent. Thank you so much for that overview. Frost and Sullivan wrote two research papers, one finding top-line opportunities in a bottom-line healthcare market focused on hospitals, and another technology as a competitive edge for post-acute providers focused on post-acute facilities. What's Frost and Sullivan's interest in technology and how that technology might enable safer care and better financial results, Charlie? At Frost and Sullivan, we're always interested in technology that can have a significant improvement on patient care, while at the same time make economic sense. In the case of contact-free continuous monitoring, we saw a technology that was in its early stage of adoption in the market, but which had both a clear clinical and economic value proposition. It's rare that I find a medical technology that clinicians and administrators are equally excited about. Also, the perceived simplicity of the system in that it only monitors three metrics, heart rate, respiratory rate, and motion, but which in turn can generate extremely useful insights that can help pick with patient deterioration, fall risk, pressure ulcer risk, and other serious conditions was interesting to me. We hear so much about analytic solutions today that cut across many different types of data, but here was a system that's extremely focused on what it monitors and is able to generate tangible benefits. So, Charlie, you refer to contact-free continuous monitoring, one of the types of monitoring systems mentioned by Priyanka. Do the conclusions in your reports apply to all patient monitoring systems or just some? Well, we've got to be clear that uh, there's continuous monitoring, there's contact-free continuous monitoring, and then there's just patient monitoring in general, which is the larger category. In the case of these two papers, we're looking explicitly at contact-free continuous monitoring as opposed to uh, monitoring in general, and looking at the specific benefits that that type of monitoring technology can deliver. Thank you, Charlie. And, and Priyanka, do you think the conclusions that Charlie reached apply to uh, other patient monitoring systems as well? When it comes to contact-free monitoring, I'm in agreement with Charlie. To generalize it to other modalities may require some more um, evidence and research. And that is based on the experience we've had interacting with our internal healthcare facilities. So the research that we did, we realized that contact monitoring could be a good choice to detect pressure ulcers or falls, since the patients usually are expected to be in their bed. But for example, to measure adequacy of ventilation, you need a solution that offers you a mode of measuring adequacy of ventilation. Oh, I certainly agree with you, Priyanka. You know, monitoring for adequacy of ventilation really recognizes basic respiration, uh, breathing in of oxygen, breathing out. And Melissa, what has been the experience of Allure Group with continuous patient monitoring? Well, in our facilities, we found that the monitoring system has been a driving factor in a lot of changes that we've seen uh, for fall prevention, as well as pain management, as well as sepsis identification. Within our first month, we were able to have great success in preventing falls. In our first home in the first 30 days, we prevented eight cases of falls by having the monitoring on, which obviously was beneficial to the patient and the patient's family member, but it also has a great impact on the facilities and the quality metrics that they're trying to achieve in regards to quality care. The monitoring systems are able to help us really have an early identification to motion to prevent a fall and are able to help through the monitoring see the beginning of a, a sepsis episode. And we're able to treat patients in-house in a more holistic way, allowing the staff to feel very empowered to do this because we're able to identify things earlier. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing the experiences of Allura. Hospitals and post-acute care facilities are clearly two very different businesses. How are these two becoming more and more interrelated? M Melissa, perhaps you could speak about your experience at Allure? Sure. So the, um, the subacute solution has really become much more of an acute care setting than it ever has been in the past. Hospitals are discharging patients much earlier. So obviously what we're finding that when the patients come in, they're often uh, 
still much sicker than we're used to, yet they feel like they're graduating to another level of care. So having this um, ability to increase the patient's education and let them understand that they still have a bit of a process to go through before they get home is a necessity. And we're also finding the uh, necessity to educate staff and to have physicians on site in subacute settings around much more often than they did in the past. The ability to increase your staffing levels and work one-on-one -on -one as much as you can, these monitoring systems really allows us to be able to focus on where the patients are right now and what help they need right this moment. Thank you, Melissa. And Charlie, as a consultant with Frost & Sullivan, how do you see this interrelationship driving changes in the healthcare market? Historically, the two types of providers have operated independently and with different revenue models. However, changes in reimbursement policies that reward continuity of care, the prevention of hospital readmissions, and better outcomes are making hospitals and post-acute providers much more aligned in their incentives, which is good news for patients and their families. One thing that continues to challenge post-acute providers is that advances in medical technology and certain kinds of reimbursement models may encourage payers to skip post-acute care in favor of home care for many patients. In order to survive, post-acute providers need to become best in class in their market and be willing to take on those more complex patients that are not well suited for home care. So really the alignment that you speak about is, is more financial than it ever has been in the past, right Charlie? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Melissa, the acuity of patients has changed over the years. How might that affect what, what uh, we've just been speaking about and what Charlie's referred to? Yes, I agree with what Charlie was just speaking about. The level of care that the subacute patients now require is just night and day from what it was even 10 years ago. The subacute patients are really needing to receive care that is just much more of an acute level. Patients that they're seeing, as Charlie mentioned, have a lot more issues, pressure ulcers, their ventilator patients, trach patients, patients with severe cardiac issues that really need to be monitored closely around the clock by nurses as well as physicians. In the past, the physician was just not involved on an ongoing 24-7 basis because the patients in the nursing homes were just not ill enough to require that. So what's really changed is that not only do we have patients being seen by primary care, especially the subacute patients, on almost a daily basis, but there's a cohort of consulting physicians that are able to come in, whether it be an infectious disease doctor or what have you, that would be able to come in and address patient-specific issues without having to transfer a patient back to the hospital. And it's really so beneficial for the patients as well as their families and the staff that we're able to receive services here. In our settings, we're even providing now cardiac drips that there's really very little things that can't be done outside of a hospital setting. So how has continuous patient monitoring helped Allure uh, with the situation and its uh, acute patients? The ability to have the continuous monitoring has changed a lot of our dynamics. Not only do they have the ability to monitor the patient and to identify cases of sepsis, to be able to start treatment earlier that would then require no transition to a hospital, but it's allowed us to have some really great reporting outcomes that we're able to use as education pieces to the staff. So it gives us a really great view of what's happening 24-7 when facility management just isn't there. And they allow us to really be able to communicate with families and to the patients that there are great successes and this is what's going on in a great reporting format that's coming right from the monitoring system. Well, that's great. It sounds like uh, documentation has helped you to figure out if there are any gaps in care and to demonstrate to patients and their families, ultimately in the courtroom, I'm thinking here as an attorney, uh, to demonstrate what steps in that care have been taken. So very valuable to do that. Sure. When you look at wound care, for example, because it's such a hot topic, the continuous monitoring not only allows an employee to document that they did the turning, but it actually documents the turn itself. It, it recognizes that the patient was positioned differently. 
and it alerts the staff member if they didn't turn the person all the way. So if they didn't offload the way that they're supposed to and they still need to work on that, the staff member wouldn't have necessarily known that in the past. They maybe would have walked out of the room. Now this gives them that prompting that they need to go back in and reposition and get that person moved appropriately. So if you found that it's helped with uh, workflow or process, um, you know, since you've started continuous monitoring patients? So absolutely, but at first, as with anything new, it takes a little time for employees to get used to it. They become slightly overwhelmed. They have a lot of questions, and, and that's great. It shows that we're working through those new workflow issues. But now that um, the employees have learned how to use it, they learn that it's the time saver, which is exactly what we've seen. The continuous monitoring has been able to really cue them of when the patient needs them. Um, and it's become a much more effective and efficient way to provide care at the bedside. And Charlie, what's been your experience at, uh, at Frost & Sullivan in this regard? Well, I think that like any new technology, it's going to have its learning curve. Uh, we talked a lot about the clinical benefits of contact-free continuous monitoring, which, of course, is the most important. But in, in our research, one nurse manager I spoke with used the system explained out it helps her staff improve their documentation, too, and reduce the number of claims that are rejected by payers. The end result was really interesting because contact-free continuous monitoring um, demonstrate improved cash flow for the facility. And I've heard a lot also about how the technology can help with nurse training and ensure better patient handoffs between shifts too. So it sounds like what uh, both of you are speaking about is that the easier the technology is to use, the better will be its use and its option. Priyanka, in uh, working with health healthcare facilities, what has been ECRI's experience in this regard? Sure. I agree with uh, your statement, Michael. The easier the technology is to use, the better are the chances for its adoption. From ECRI Institute's experience, we have learned that hospitals first and foremost try to identify if continuous monitoring is indeed needed for their care environment. Once they've made a decision that they have a clinical need that could be solved using continuous monitoring, some of the key factors that drive the implementation and use of technology uh, how easy is the technology to use, staff education, and cost of implementation. Charlie and Melissa, they both spoke about staff education and clinicians have been traditionally using a project monitor or not using a monitor at all. Therefore, they need to learn both a new or modified workflow and also a new way to think about their patients. Another factor is the cost of using the system. The initial cost is only one consideration. But our healthcare facilities that we spoke with also mentioned the cost of the uni road and the ongoing and initial training costs. I would like to point out as well that when I talk about continuous monitoring, I'm including all forms of monitoring that include variable, bedside, and contact free monitoring. So I'm just wondering whether you think that an easier to use technology might be better suited for general care floor patients, uh, and that maybe a more complex system is better suited in, in the ICU setting. Um, what do you guys think of that? Absolutely. The monitoring technology has to be appropriate to the level of care and the needs of the, of the patient. So you wouldn't use something like CFCM in an operating room, for example. It just isn't relevant, and there are a lot more metrics that you need to offer. So. To me, the exciting potential is really extending the benefits of monitoring into those areas that have historically not been uh, very reliant on monitoring. That would mean the home, it would mean post-acute care facilities uh, where there's value, but the degree of monitoring the, and the technology needs to be appropriate not only to the patient, but to the skill level of the, of the providers and the, and the practitioners there. So, Melissa, I'm gathering you would concur that the ease of use of the patient monitoring device has certainly impacted staff adoption and use? Absolutely, the ease of training is paramount. Also, I think that staff, once they start to see all the positive outcomes, they become bought into the system as well. So the ease of use gets over that initial fear of using it. And then as soon as they start to see the positive outcomes, 
and they really become bought into it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Melissa. So Priyanka, what types of uh, questions should a healthcare facility uh, look at when considering between the different types of continuous patient monitoring systems that are available? So the first and foremost thing to consider is the clinical need. So clinicians should identify the parameters and the patient conditions that the care area plans to look for and then find the system that claims to cover those parameters and conditions. We need to identify the system that has appropriate sensitivity and specificity for the clinical need to make sure that nurses are alerted to actionable alarms and not overburdened with non-actionable situations. Then consider how well each prospective system would help attain the desired workflow for your care area. Once the preceding steps are thought out, is when one would look into the modality of monitoring. That is, wearable versus website versus contact fee. And finally, consider the cost. Unfortunately, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Great advice, Priyanka. Knowing what the clinical need is will certainly help in deciding what technological solutions may be the best fit. In, in finding top-line opportunities in a bottom-line healthcare market, Charlie, you base your analysis on a 200-bed hospital near Chicago, Illinois, with 80 med surge beds and an average occupancy rate of 85%. What did you conclude? So in that paper, we developed a hypothetical model using that average median hospital that uh, was imaginary to determine what kind of impact, economically speaking, an imaginary average hospital could expect to see with a very conservative adoption model of contact-free continuous monitoring. So we laid out the assumptions that you shared along with a number of other ones describing a hospital that would add this type of monitoring to all of its 80 med search beds. And what we found is that it could re result in about $2 million in additional revenue and an extra 1% to its operating margin, all while delivering better care. And this is being driven by three factors. First and foremost, that uh, use of contact-free continuous monitoring could decrease length of stay, thereby freeing up bed space for new patients. Second, monitoring uh, along those lines can improve clinical outcomes, thereby improving a facility's ranking under Medicare's value-based pricing model. Finally, contact-free continuous monitoring can help spot patients with conditions that might otherwise go undetect before it's too late, thereby generating the need for additional healthcare services the hospital can provide. Those are great uh, conclusions. Thanks so much for, for sharing that. Um, what would you think is the, the obstacles to adopting continuous uh, monitoring, Charlie? Well, I think, uh, first of all, it's just awareness, letting providers know about the technology and its ability to uh, be adopted. I think there are some providers that are intimidated about uh, integrating new technology into their system, but it's, it's relatively simple compared to a lot of other uh, IT platforms. Um, and and uh, the last one is really um, staff adoption and staff learning, uh, integrating it into something that they're already doing. So I think that uh, awareness, uh, IT integration, and the, uh, the willingness to uh, encourage people to try new things are the biggest challenges. There are many types of patient monitoring devices in the market, and there will likely be more developed in the future. Do you see many different patient monitoring devices being developed within the same healthcare facility. For example, one device being used in ICU, and another type on the general care floor, and yet another with pediatric patients or other types of patients. Charlie, what's your thoughts on that? Absolutely, like I had mentioned before, the monitoring technology needs to be appropriate to the patient. Um, I think the more interesting things will be um, what you do with that data relative to the unique needs of that patient. So, uh, uh, for example, in pediatrics, asthma is a really, really big challenge. It's one of the leading reasons why children are admitted to the emergency room. Uh, you would be very uh, interested in a type of patient monitoring technology that could be used with those frequent flyers maybe at home to, to keep them from bouncing back into the ER. In contrast, um, COPD and heart failure are much bigger respiratory issues for older populations. So you, you would be uh, 
inclined to look at new types of analytic platforms and, and uh, patient monitoring tools that can help that. The hardware is going to be relatively similar across the different populations, but it's really what you do with the information uh, for that appropriate patient that's going to make a difference. I agree. Certainly sifting through all that data, which might not have been available uh, without using patient monitoring, is now available uh, once those patient monitoring devices are, are in place. Any, any further thoughts, uh, Melissa and, and Priyanka, on this? I'd like to comment on something Charlie said. I think that the, the key of, of really being able to put in a uh, unit that is truly successful is its versatility. So I can give an example that you know, we're able to train staff on the unit, and it's able to be used differently with different patients or even with the same patient at different times during their stay. And I think that once you're able to get staff familiar with a unit and how it works, they're able to really customize the patient experience. If that patient needs fall monitoring when they first come in, well, then we can use that setting. But as they progress and they become more independent, then that can come off. Same thing with wound care. As their wounds heal and get better or they get stronger and they're able to turn and position themselves, well, maybe the staff isn't going in and, and doing the work, but you're reminding the patient and you're able to monitor that the patient has successfully done that. So I think that it's very valuable to be able to be able to progress the patient experience through the monitoring system. A great observation. And that's really adapting the monitoring devices to the patient need, which is an excellent point. Looking at the monitoring technologies that are out there, are there improvements to this technology that you'd want to see in the future? Absolutely. So a better understanding and a consensus on which parameters are necessary to identify or predict levels of clinical events like sepsis and deterioration would be helpful. Having data from these systems is great. What I'd also like to see is how hospitals can really get meaningful data and use this to their advantage. Great point. Thank you so much. Uh... So thank you, Melissa, Priyanka, and Charlie, for your great insights into continuous patient monitoring. I hope that clinicians, hospital executives, and risk managers hearing this podcast will find your advice, recommendations, and experience to be useful in helping them select the most appropriate patient monitoring device for their clinical needs. So thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank you.